Cool. Good morning, church. How are we doing? Uh, fantastic. Really good to see everybody, man. I'm so glad that miracles are taking place in our church on the daily. Um, there's a thing that happens on Sundays when it rains that Christians actually evaporate. But it's so nice to see that. That's not the case in this church. We're in the building. We're ready to worship God together. And it's been a fantastic morning so far. And I'm seeing some men of faith in the building. Neil with his Liverpool shirt on. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we just proclaim your peace and your mercy tonight. Against the enemy that is the red devil, Jesus, we rebuke him. We rebuke him. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. So now what we've done is you've set the tone for how we're going to clap today. If you clap more for Liverpool than you do for the Word of God, I mean, that's for you and Jesus to navigate later on. So good to see everybody. My name is Phil. Um, if I've yet to have the pleasure of meeting you, I'm a pastor here at Revive Church, and I love our church. Um, I love Sundays. I love being able to gather here as a church family, and I feel incredibly blessed today to be able to share um, our third week of our prayer series. The first two weeks, Swen has shared some amazing messages. Who's been blessed uh, and encouraged by some of these messages on prayer? Um, it's a, it's a fundamental um, in our faith, and it's something that is so important, but often we, we can find ourselves misinformed or find that we don't actually have the right tools, or we don't feel equipped to have an amazing prayer life. Well, what we're really trying to do this week and over the last few weeks is to give us the tools so that we can learn how to pray, and to pray well and to engage with our Father in heaven. And today, um, I've got the great honor and privilege of sharing a message on uh, persistent prayer, and I've entitled it, The Powerful Prayers of Persistent People. I'm a sucker for an alliteration, especially in a sermon, but you can take that note down today. And even just before I get into the message today, um, I felt quite led during worship, and I'm, I'm so guilty of this sometimes, that I will get into uh, sermons, I'll get into prayer time, and I'll just kind of run into it and rush into it without actually first acknowledging who I'm preaching about or who I'm praying to. And today, I really just wanted to take a moment, and, and if you wouldn't mind, uh, just closing your eyes, just, just for 20 seconds, I'd love for us to just take a moment just to prepare our hearts um, for what God would want to do today and what He wants to do in our hearts. And Lord God, we acknowledge who You are today. You are the King of heaven and earth who reigns in heaven. Lord, we thank you that you are the creator. We thank you, God, that you designed us. You put us together, God. You have got a great future and plan for every single person sitting in the building today. God, let us never uh, rush or take light what you're doing in our world and in Cape Town. And Lord, we pray that would you please speak to us today. Holy Spirit, would you reveal yourself to us today in a way that has never, ever happened before. And God, would you help us to leave here changed? God, we don't want a faith or a Christianity that is so mundane and that's just about coming and going. God, we want a faith that is alive, that is on fire, and that can only happen when the Spirit enters our hearts. We love you, Lord. We give you all the glory. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, amen. We've got a good God in heaven. He wants to talk to you today. He wants to move in your life, move in your heart. Never accept a faith that feels dead or mundane, because that's not the God we serve. We serve a God who is moving, who is active, and who is powerful. Can I get an amen? amen. Come on, somebody. We're going to be talking about persistent prayer. I'm loving the clapping. Roxy's ready getting into it. Come on, girl. Come on, girl. Yeah, that's right. Liverpool can't be better than Jesus. I want to say it's close, but it's not. Okay. Okay. I've got a couple of scriptures today that I really just want to uh, share and set the tone for a message on persistent prayer. Um, praying persistently is the vital bit of Christianity and a bit of faith that we have to strive towards as believers, but it can be challenging. One of the main enemies to persistent prayer, and what I mean by persistent prayer, I mean an attitude that never ceases to pray and bring requests to God, even when there is disappointment, even when there is discouragement. The greatest enemy to persistent prayer is, in fact, discouragement. Are we able to have a steadfast faith and a steadfast prayer life when it looks like things aren't going the way that we thought they would go, or it feels like our prayers aren't being answered? Is there anybody in church today that has ever felt like that? You're praying and you're bringing requests before God, but it actually doesn't feel like He's hearing you or He's answering those prayers. And some of the scriptures that I really want to set the tone with today is Ephesians 6.18 in the NLT. It says, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert. Be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. The scripture teaches a persistent 
prayer life, one that continually seeks God and seeks to lay our desires and our requests before Him. Colossians 4 verse 2 in the Amplified Version says, be persistent and devoted to prayer, being alert and focused in your prayer life with an attitude of thanksgiving. We're getting painted a picture of what our prayer life should look like, what we should be striving towards. The question that I have found myself asking is why do I need to ask God for the same thing over and over and over again? Why does God want to hear my nagging and my pestering and just a constant, God, I need this, I need this, I need this. Is that what persistent prayer is all about? Uh, Sometimes I've chatted to people in our life group. They said, you know what, I've got a desire in my heart and I really feel like I want this thing and I need this thing and I pray about it, but I actually don't know when potentially the answer is no, or when I should stop praying, or when I should move on. And persistent prayer kind of paints this tension of like, do I just keep going for something in the hope that God will answer me and find me there? Or do I stop praying and just take it as a no because it hasn't happened immediately? Quite frankly, I wanna try to give us an understanding and some clarity on what persistent prayer is, because what it is not is a constant begging and pestering and God, would you do this, would you do this, would you do this, without taking notice of what God is already doing and already answering in your life. Who knows that we can be so caught up and want something so badly that it becomes the main focus of our hearts. Man, I've had seasons like that. As a person, I've wanted PlayStation games, I've wanted sports tops, where where it's it's everything I can think about. And sometimes we can have a desire on our hearts that it feels like it's the only thing I need and we're praying and we're praying and we actually won't take no for an answer. I wanna preface the message today by saying that God loves you. He loves your prayers. He loves the desires on your heart. In fact, scripture says that he placed them there. But persistent prayer has a dual outcome for us, church. One, yes, it's to get something from God. It's to see breakthrough in an area. But also God is very interested in doing something inside of you. Sometimes persistent prayer and trusting and continuing to have faith for something over a long period of time does more inside of you than it actually does for the thing that you want or the desire that you need. I wanna tell you something, Jesus is so concerned with your character, with what's happening on the inside, with the formation, and today I wanna teach a message that says persistent prayer. Yes, we wanna see God move in amazing ways, but also God wants to do amazing things in your heart. So we're gonna look at a scripture today, um, a a very cool scripture uh, in Luke 18, verse one to eight, that talks about praying persistently, and this is Jesus teaching his followers through a parable. And if any of you um, have read about a parable, have heard about a parable, a parable is a story that Jesus would use to teach a truth. So this is Jesus' teaching in Luke 18, verse 1 to 8, and it says this. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Verse 2, he said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. There was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice and that she won't eventually come and attack me. The Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That last scripture uh, is interesting and we're gonna come back to that. But really what we're finding in this passage of scripture is we're being introduced to a couple of characters. The first one is this judge, this unjust judge. And Jesus makes it very clear in the parable that this is not a good man. Uh, It's a guy who doesn't love God, and it's a guy who doesn't love people. It's a powerful man, but someone you wouldn't trust with power. And then you get acquainted to another character, the widow. And whenever you read about a widow or orphans or, or people of that nature in scripture, you can already acquaint them with someone who is powerless, someone who doesn't have. And it's this dynamic of somebody going to someone who isn't good really wanting something, really seeking something, really needing something. And she, she goes every day and she brings this request and lays it before the judge every day. And suddenly he becomes so hurtful. It's not because he loves her. It's not because he wants to give her this thing because it's gonna bless her. He becomes so over the fact that she won't leave him alone that he grants her this request. 
Jesus then creates a contrast between these two characters. He says, yes, we've got this, this unjust judge, but then we've got our God in heaven who loves us, who, who wants the desires of your heart for you, who wants to do life with you. Will he not grant the desires of the heart and the scripture says of his chosen ones? of his believers, will he not do that and do that quickly for the people that he loves and that, he lo- and that they love him? And then the scripture ends with saying, when the son of man returns, will he find faith in the earth? I, I love this passage. And I think right now it would be really great to set the tone for what persistent prayer is. And I've made mention to it before. What persistent prayer is, is not blindly every day bringing the same request the same plea, the same desire before God, waiting for Him to give you your answer. What persistent prayer is, is coming to God with a boldness, with a confidence, with a trust that the God in heaven loves you and wants to answer your prayers. Persistent prayer is a character trait that we develop as believers that when I'm feeling great or when I'm feeling bad, my God never changes. He stays the good God in heaven. So when I'm going through something and I really need an answer, God, I'm gonna continually seek your face. I'm gonna continually find you because you are the only good thing in my life. You're the only thing I can trust in my life. You're the only thing that can give good gifts in my life so I will continue to seek you and find your face. That's persistent prayer. So what the scripture might be teaching is that, no, we should be like the widow. You know, just bother God enough so that he can get hutful enough to give you what you need. Can I give us a a different way to look at persistent prayer today? I think persistent prayer is less about nagging and pestering and more about trusting the heart and the resources and the love of God that even if it isn't the thing that you've got on your heart, He loves you enough to lead you to a thing that's even better. Even when the timing of the thing that you really want, and I know there's, there's probably gonna be people in church today that have got desires on their heart, things that they wanna see move in their lives, good things, man. I don't stand here today and say God waits for the good requests and he grants those and he, and he waits a time on the bad ones. There are some good things, but when you trust in the character of God, you trust in the timing of God. Is it crazy enough to believe church, it says in Isaiah, uh, that his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. Is it crazy enough to believe that there is possibly something that might be a request on your heart or a want on your heart, but he's got something better? Is it crazy enough to believe that you want it right now, but Jesus is saying, hey, right now is not gonna bless you, but in a year's time or in two years' time, that's gonna bring everything that you ever wanted. Is it crazy enough to trust God to be God? And I know it's a tough one, because if you're anything like me, patience is not a spiritual gift of mine. I'm like, God, this is such a good request, God. Just make me the best preacher in the world. So every Sunday... I can come and I can bring a word that changes lives. And God might be saying, well, Phil, I don't think you quite yet have the character to sustain being the best preacher, but we're gonna wait a little while and we're gonna take you on a journey because that's gonna form something inside of you and you're gonna be a bigger and better believer for it. Can we trust in the timing of God that if the thing that's in your heart and it burns in your heart, maybe you want a kid, maybe you want a promotion, maybe you wanna see something move in your family's life, maybe just maybe that thing is not the thing for right now, but it is the thing for the future. Can we be steadfast in our faith to keep praying, to keep believing, to keep laying it at the feet of God without getting downcast. Man, I get disappointed in life. I get discouraged in life. There are so many things about the world we live in today that leans to us deterring and diminishing in our faith because there is tragedy, there is disappointment, there's discouragement. And can I give you a news flash today? We we live in a broken world. We live in a sinful world. That is our reality. So the journey of the believer is not to have faith in the really good times, but then to shy away from God in the bad times because we think he's abandoned us or left us. The journey of the believer, the journey of spiritual maturity is saying, regardless of what is happening in front of me, I'm gonna trust God the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. One of the greatest promises in scripture is that our God never changes. And South Africans, we need to jump on board with the fact that everything in front of us might be insane, it might be crazy, but our God is so good and He stays good and we need to continually seek His face, His sovereignty, His timing, and the fact that He might have something better for you today. That's persistent prayer. Praying without ceasing coming to God with confidence. For some of you today, the revelation needs to drop that God loves you. He loves your prayers. 
He desires to have a relationship with you, but just because it's not being answered right now doesn't mean God has left you or forgotten about you. Does that make sense today? The scripture ends there in um, Luke chapter 18 by saying, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in the earth? Now, when I first read that, I'm like, on a passage that's talking about prayer, that almost feels a little, I don't know, random. It, it feels a little bit out of place. It's like, we know Jesus is coming back, but why are we dropping that in there in a passage where we're talking about persistent prayer? And then when I kind of looked around at the context and what was happening in Luke chapter 17, it became quickly apparent that what this parable was also teaching about a time that when Jesus comes back. The scripture isn't just teaching on persistent prayer, it's actually also teaching on persistent faith. So I try to understand the connection. I'm like, well, God, why would we be talking about persistent prayer and then lead straight into a scripture where will Jesus come back and find faith? Well, the truth is in the world we live in today, staying steadfast in your faith, being a Christian at 25 and then continuing to be a Christian at 75 or 80 years old is an incredibly difficult task. There are so many things that come along the way and that can deter us. So what we need is we need a way. We need tools. We need to be equipped with a thing that, help, that can help us be steadfast, that can help us run the marathon of faith, not, not sprint hard, not come to church and get saved and serve in every area and lead worship, but then 10 or 15 years' time, you've completely disconnected from God and from the church and from His heart. That's not our goal for you. I would rather you be much slower in the flame, but let it continue to glow brighter and warmer as you get older. I love meeting people in their 70s and their 80s that love Jesus. I don't know about you. Someone that's had to stand the test of time, be steadfast in their faith, so when Jesus comes back, he finds faith in their heart. Here, I believe, is the connection. If we want to be persistent in our faith, have steadfast faith over 70, 75 years, we need to be persistent in our prayer. We need to be steadfast in our ability to connect with God on a regular basis. Why? When we pray to God, when we focus on God, we take our eyes off of our situation. We take our eyes off of what is disappointing us, what is bringing pain, what is bringing heartache, and you put your eyes on a God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. You put your eyes on a God who created you, who knew every mistake you'd make, every sin, every error you'd commit in your life, and he chooses to love you anyway. He continues to have a greater day for you, a greater future, and you say, God, I need as much time focusing on you and the least amount of time focusing on my situation. Do you know who was brilliant at this? was David. Who's read the Psalms before? You've, you've read a Psalm. The Psalms paint an amazing picture of what David tried to do in this. And I'm going to read a couple for you because I just, I love them. Psalm 25 verse 15. My eyes are always on the Lord, for he rescues me from the traps of my enemies. My eyes are always on the Lord. He is the one who can rescue me, not my bank account. Not my family, not the things that I have put as an idol in my life because I've wanted them so bad and I've pushed so bad for them. And when I've got them, what happens when you get the thing that you've wanted for such a long time? Often you move on to another thing. The things of the earth, material things, do very badly at sustaining the heart, do very badly at providing satisfaction. Do you know what does a fantastic job at satisfying your soul and gives you peace? It's actually a thriving relationship with Jesus. If you meet a believer, and a believer that is in a relationship with God, none of us are perfect. We put our college shirts on, we come to church on a Sunday, praise Jesus, you know. We act really well. None of us are perfect. But if you're in a relationship with God that is growing and thriving, and you're willing to be corrected, you're willing to learn, you will find people that are happy in a situation where they shouldn't be happy. You'll find people that have peace in a moment where, listen, mate, like, I don't know if you've noticed this, but your life is, a, is not really in a place where I would have peace. It's like, you know what? My peace doesn't come from this world. My peace comes from a thriving relationship with Jesus. If I was waiting on a political peace, if I was waiting on a peace that comes from my relationships, man, I would be anxious till the day I die. If you want to get away from anxiety, and please, I, I respect that. And I, I struggle sometimes with anxiety. I struggle sometimes with worrying. But the moments where I feel like I get alleviated from that is the moments I actually put my eyes on Jesus. And I say, Lord, only you can rescue me from the traps of my enemies. There's another psalm that I love. Psalm 105 verse 4. Search for the Lord and for his strength, continually seek him. Church, if we're going to try to do life 
by ourselves. If we're going to try to do life in the resources that you've got, the skills that you've got, the knowledge that you've got, you will come up short. Listen, you might have a good slog at it. You might get to 40, 45, build something really cool, but at some point the wheels come off. It's only God who can sustain and maintain the creation that he's put in place. He is the strength that we need and that we rely on. And in every message that I do, I try to find uh, an example from the Gospels. I try to find an example from the life of Jesus because Jesus really is the center of everything that we do. The amazing thing about Jesus is that he came to earth fully God, fully man, but the brilliant thing about the Gospels is that he sets an example for how we can live. Jesus is the, is the blueprint. Those, those bangles, whoever had a green, what would Jesus do, bangle. It's a tough bangle to have because you aren't Jesus. <laughs> So most of the time, you're going to miss the mark, but, but I love the point. It's what would Jesus do? He is the blueprint. He is the example. He is everything we need to be closer to God. He is everything we need to live this life well and to live this life strong. And there's a great example of prayer and Jesus' example for prayer in Luke chapter 22, verse 41 to 42. Some of you may know the context here. Jesus finds himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, this would have been a few hours before Jesus would have been dragged into court, uh, falsely accused, beaten, made to carry his own cross, and murdered on Calvary. Luckily for us, he would rise from the dead three days later. But you can understand that from the man side of Jesus, fully God, fully man, this would have been an incredibly tough moment to have to navigate for a person, to understand that I'm about to die and there's nothing I can do about it. So he prays his prayer. In Luke 22, verse 41 to 42. It says, he withdrew from a stone's throw beyond them. He knelt down and he prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. Can you sense the maturity of the prayer here today? God, if it's your will, it's almost like a last Ditch effort. To, if there's another way we can say, I love humanity. I love, I, I love these guys. They're amazing. If there's another way we can save them, could that please happen? Because this is a tough thing to have to go through. This is a tough season I'm going to have to move through over the next few days. If there is another way, would you please pass this cup from me? I see myself in that prayer. Whenever there are tough moments in my life, I'm saying, God, would you just shift it along? Would you just move it through? Could I just get to the end of this? Because going through tough things is tough for us as people. But Jesus then concludes the prayer prayer by saying, God, if you can move it, would you move it? But not my will, your will be done. Can you see that Jesus completely trusts the character, the heart, and the resources of his God in heaven by saying, God, this is what I want, but I understand that what I want is on limited information. I understand what I need sometimes is not based on the full picture. Here's the brilliant thing about God for those of you that need another picture. God has a bird's eye view of your life. What does that mean? He doesn't just see today. He doesn't just see tomorrow. He sees five years in advance. He sees 10 years in advance. He sees 25 years in advance. The thing you think you need for your kids right now might be a curse in the future. God says, you know what? Why don't you hold on to that? Why don't you trust me and my timing right now? I'm going to give you the thing that you need for this season. And if it's not the thing you want, I'm going to give you the thing that you need. When we pray persistently, we give it over. Jesus says, God, not my will, but your will be done. He, he takes a step back and he hands it over to God completely. There's a, there's a revelation that I would love for us to leave church with today. And it's this, there are some here today that maybe have desires on their hearts, good desires. And and I'm I'm really, I'm I'm speaking to you today. This message is for you. You could be sitting here today saying, you know what? This is something on my heart. This is something I've been trusting God for. This is something I'm believing for. And there are maybe two ways that you can move through this. The one is, and the band can, can start playing behind me. The one is, God might be saying, hey, this is a good thing. The timing is not quite there yet. What I need you to do is to stay consistent. What I need you to do is to stay persistent. What I need you to do is not let your faith diminish, but let your faith grow as you continually seek me in this every day and continue to lift it up in prayer. There might be somebody else that's sitting here today that's saying, this is the desire on my heart. And the truth is maybe the desire on your heart, the way that you see it and the way that you want it and the way that you envision it playing out in your life, that isn't the plan that God has for your life. Can we take a step of maturity and saying, God, you know what? This is what I want. But if you've got something better for me, please help me to see it. 
If you've got something better for me, open that door and help me to walk through it with faith. If you've got something that is gonna bless my family and bless my church and bless the people in my life, don't let me be so caught up on the thing that I really want or the thing that I really need. Help me to get onto your page, God, and let me step into what you have got for me today. What persistent prayer does, is it becomes an amazing filter of what your actual desires are what your actual priorities are, actually where your maturity is at, actually where your faith is at. Um, is it me popping? Am I popping here? Should I take a step back? Sometimes I get, you know, the spirit starts moving and then the gear around me just starts freaking out. That's my bad, church. <laughs> your ability to pray persistently, to pray without ceasing is a great indicator of where you're at in your faith, in your maturity, where your desires are, where your priorities are. Can I encourage us as a church as we lean into 2023? We're about to get into a fast as a church in the build up to Easter. And we love this, this rhythm of fasting before Easter because it feels like it, it sets us up for what God wants to do in Easter. Can I encourage you as a church and in your prayer life to begin to trust God more with what he's got for you, with the heart that he has for you, with the character, with the resources that he has. God has every provision you've ever needed. God has every answer you've ever needed. Any prayer that you've ever prayed, God can do a miracle, can bring breakthrough in your life whenever the time is right. Persistent prayer's key is, the key is quite simple. Can we begin to trust God's timing and trust the things that he has for us even when it looks slightly different? I'll take you back to the Old Testament. Moses was leading the Israelites and he needed a way out. Back towards an ocean, millions of people following him, Pharaoh's army chasing him. I can tell you at that point, he wasn't saying, God, would you please split open the Red Sea? Because that's a thing that happens. Would you do that for me, God? No, I'm sure, I'm sure Moses in that moment was praying, God, give us strength, you know, send rocket launches from, from heaven like manna so we can bomb Pharaoh. And he, he would have prayed anything that he has known. But God says, I'm not in the business of conforming to what you know. I'm in the business of doing what is a new thing. I'm in the business of doing what is miraculous. I'm in the business of doing what is a breakthrough. So you might not yet have the answer. God, I need this job. God, I, I, I want another child and we're getting older. You might have so many concerns and so many worries. Can I tell you something? God is not concerned about your concerns. The things that worries you about this world, the things that you think will get in the way, cannot get in the way of what God wants to do in your life. The responsibility and the only responsibility when it comes to answer prayer rests with us and saying, God, can I meet your miraculous? Can I meet your supernatural with a very natural ability to say, God, I will not stop praying. I will not stop believing. I will not let my faith diminish. I'll continue to seek you in every moment, in every season, because you are God in heaven, creator of the heavens and the earth, the alpha and the omega. He is not your personal God who messes up when you mess up. He's not your personal God who, who does things in the same way and messes things up the way to. He is God on high. He is perfect and He loves you. I want to, we're going to sing a song, but I want to conclude with one scripture. It's 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 to 17. And we've been talking about and grow memorizing scripture. And uh, for those of you that struggle, here's a great scripture to start memorizing because it's four words but I believe it's words that encapsulate what God is wanting to do here today. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 17 says, Rejoice always, pray continually. Can I tell you what will change your life? Is a positive attitude. <laughs> man, oh man, negative people drain the out of me. How easy is it to become negative in this world? Man, you have to, and flip, I have my, He's my aunt. I'm, I'm there. I can be so negative. I can look at everything that's going wrong and I can let it affect the way that I think, the way that I pray, the way that I deal with people. I love that scripture. It says the antidote to a negative attitude is rejoice always. Can I tell you something? There is always something to rejoice over as a believer. Man, oh man, there is always something to rejoice over. Sometimes I just need to take a step back and rejoice about my salvation. That at 15 years old, this punk who had nothing going for him, God said, you know what? Let's just introduce some good people. Phil, I'm gonna call you home. And what your life is gonna look like up until this point, you've got no idea. 
But I said, Jesus, thank you so much for reaching out to me and for saving my life when nothing about me deserved or warranted it. Jesus said, you know what? I give you salvation anyway. Sometimes I just rejoice about that. Other times I just take a few minutes, I look around and I thank God for the things that are in my life. Rejoice always. It is the antidote to a negative mindset. It is the antidote to discouragement. Discouragement will rob persistent prayer from you because it tells you God's not listening. God doesn't care. He's not gonna move in your life. When we can say, God, I've got faith for a better day because you are a good God. I've got faith for breakthrough. I've got faith for the miraculous. And faith is contagious. Just like negative people drain me, when I get around people that are loving God, faithful, encouraged, I just, it's, it like lights me up. It's like a candle lighting another candle. If we can be a church that can be so positive, so faithful, so ready for what God is gonna do. And it's not blind positivity. It's not ignoring the world and just saying, you know what? Like that meme with the little dog in the fire. I'm fine. Like, <laughs> I'm not advocating that, but when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire, they were fine because Jesus promises to stand in the fire with us. Persistent prayer is a lifestyle. It's an attitude. And me, at 75 or 80 years, I might not have done half the things that I'm planning and preparing for myself, but if I can remain to love Jesus at 75 or 80 years old, I'm gonna be so grateful. The way that I'm gonna do that is by saying, God, I need my eyes fixed on you. You are my resource, you are my strength. You bring the breakthrough. Is that okay this morning? Can I pray for us? Lord, I sense that you're speaking to us today in a very real way. Lord, I sense that you're speaking to people that have maybe been on the journey of persistent prayer. Maybe there's been things on their heart they're trusting God for. Maybe as they sit here today, they really can't quite understand why it hasn't come to pass. Maybe they feel discouraged and disappointed. Maybe they feel like you have left the room. God, we wanna to acknowledge today that you have not left the room. God, we want to acknowledge today that you are our King of Kings. The Alpha and the Omega, you have not left the room. You have heard every prayer. You love every prayer. You've heard every desire. You love every desire. God, help us to understand that we can trust your timing and we can trust your leading. Holy Spirit, where you have been leading our church, where you've been leading us as individuals, possibly through something else, possibly through a new door that we'd never even thought of or imagined. Would you help our spirits to grow sensitive to your leading today, Lord? Help us to understand when you're nudging and moving and possibly putting us in a different direction because the ultimate goal is not to get what we're praying for. The ultimate goal is to hear from God, a God that always answers. And God, I wanna pray for people today that are maybe struggling with faith. Maybe things have happened in life. Life just hasn't quite worked out the way you thought it would work out. And right now, you could be at a crossroads. You're struggling with faith. You're struggling to believe that God is really this God of love, a God that sees you, a God that wants to give you every good thing. I really wanna pray for you today, if that's you. I wanna encourage you, I wanna uplift you. God has put this message together for you. He loves you, you are a prized son and daughter of the most high God. And just because things haven't quite worked out the way you thought they would up until now, doesn't mean that the best days aren't ahead of you. Good days, great days, days where God has set you apart to be a leader in your work, a leader in your family, to be spirit-led and spirit-strengthened. God, we pray for giants of the faith from our church today. Not because we're perfect or because we're amazing, God, but because we can lean on the strength and the understanding that you are our God who loves us and who calls us and who sets us apart for every good work. If there is anybody here today at church that is going through one of these moments where maybe you've been trusting God for something and it hasn't quite happened, your faith is diminishing, you need a fresh touch, you need the Holy Spirit to speak to you right now. Wherever you are, just stand up. All eyes are closed and heads are bowed. If you're in the building today, you need something new and something fresh from God, just stand up wherever you are. I'd love to pray for you. Yep, there's people standing up. That's you, just stand up. That's your moment right now. Stand up. I just wanna pray for you. Pray for fresh faith. Pray that God speaks to you right now, reminds you of His love, reminds you that He sees you and He walks with you. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anybody else? Just stand up. If that's you, don't ignore the moment. Just stand up. Yep. People standing up everywhere. If that's you, just stand up.
Come on, let's, let's give it over. Yep. You need something fresh from God. You need His voice. You need His leading. If that's you, just stand up wherever you are. Yep. People continue to stand up. If that's you, just stand up. Just stand up right now. If that's you, come on, stand up. Thank you, Jesus. You need something fresh from God. You need Him to speak to you, to lead you. Just stand up wherever you are. Good, 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 good. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to start praying, but if that's you, just continue to stand up. Continue to trust God. Thank you, Lord. Yep. Father God, we worship you today. We glorify your name, Jesus. You are our king. You are our creator. God, you are our father in heaven who loves us. God, thank you so much that every single day of my life you have planned and prepared. And God, the best that I try to mess it up with my mistakes and my sinfulness, you are still so good. And you still make a way in the wilderness for me to be the person you've called me to be, to step into the purpose in your will. God, I pray for every single person standing right now, God. Whatever they're needing from you today, if it's a fresh touch from your Holy Spirit, if it's an injection of faith, if it's understanding that right now, God, you see them, you love them, you've called them to something so much better. God, wherever they're standing right now, Holy Spirit, would you fill them head to toe right now in this moment, in this space, Lord. If you're standing, just raise your hands. God, we worship you today. We, we ask for it. God, our hands are up because in our hands, we get very little done. But God, when you give it to us, we are powerful and we can be mighty in this earth. God, we just pray right now, fresh touch from you, Holy Spirit. In this moment, we worship you, Lord. And all of God's people said, amen.